Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julia Caro, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Discovering the Missing Link Between My Rare Disease and an Olympic Athlete. The sponsor of this webinar is Congenica. Our panelists today are Jill Viles, an Emery Dreyfus Muscular Dystrophy Patient Advocate, Suzanne Drury, Laboratory Head in Clinical Genomics and Personalized Medicine Specialist at Congenica, and Helen Savage, the Deputy Head of Clinical Services at Congenica. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the control panel, which normally appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box on the upper right side of the control panel, and when you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask our speakers your questions after their talks have concluded. With that, let me turn it over to Jill. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Um, I've really been looking forward to sharing my story with you. It's, it's really um, an honor. And I'm so very appreciative of all the wonderful things Congenica has done to solve um, a genetic mystery in my family. Um, as I began my search for answers in my early 20s and late teens, um, I never would have expected that my journey would cross paths was a very famous elite sprinter. Um, and certainly, I could have never imagined that we would possibly have something genetic in common. Um, but as I learned more about my condition and about Priscilla's, it appeared we were actually cut from a very uh, same very rare cloth. And it's something that's just truly been a miracle in my life and something I hope that inspires you as well as you hear my story. Um, what I'd like to do is start in my early childhood and provide some feedback um, about my medical condition, um, how it initially presented, and what initially the doctors felt was going on. Um, when I was born, I appeared to be um, a normally developed infant. There weren't any concerns um, offered by the doctor at birth. And my early milestones also occurred without any problems. Things such as crawling, standing, um, walking were all occurring on time. Um, however, years later, I really didn't even hear this story until maybe three or four years ago. But one of my aunts commented that when she saw me as a newborn baby and her own child, also a newborn, was next to me, she had noticed that um, she was a little startled to see that it seems my backside and legs appeared too small. And she was talking about both fat and muscle. And it kind of alarmed her, but she felt like, who wants to say something to a new mother that there could be something wrong? But she and her had a gut, gut instinct that something was different when she first saw me at birth. And I think my parents probably were always concerned in early childhood. Um, I did stumble frequently, and I would often ask to be carried. But you know, I suppose a parent might assume a child is kind of clingy or there's some other logical explanation for why they want to be carried. And um, my dad, when he was young, also um, had a different run from the other children, though he you know, played very well in, in different games and activities, but struggled to keep up on long walks. And when he was a young child, the doctor assumed he had a mild case of polio. So there were those concerns in my father's medical history, but of course, you know, I assume all parents just hope that everything will be okay with their children. Um, it wasn't until a preschool teacher called that my parents really had to face something was wrong because when they would see me walk with the other children, um, I would fall behind. I'd often trip in the hallways. And the preschool teacher noticed that when the other children would run in the gymnasium, I would just stand and watch the other kids. So she called my mother to, to tell her, and it was a really hard phone call for my mom, but um, they took me to the pediatrician and he had over the years noted that I was a smaller child but assumed maybe I was a picky eater or maybe just a small child. But when faced with this extra information, he had me um, sit on the floor of the exam room and then you know, was trying to encourage me to be a bird, to stand up, and he noticed that each time I did that, I would push off on my knee to stand up which is um, a positive Gower sign. 
And even when pointed out not to do that and they asked me to stand up, I would, I would keep doing that. So he knew what he was, was seeing, but he said it was different from the other muscular dystrophies he normally would see, um, primarily Duchenne. And he said, um, with Duchenne, you normally see large, lazy muscles. And when he was examining me, my muscles were small and very tight. And he said it just was something different than he was used to seeing. Um, and definitely was out of his league and we needed to be followed at the Mayo Clinic. So we traveled up to Minnesota and even had a chance to meet with the chair of the genetics department who examined um, myself and my father. And definitely he could tell this is a genetic disorder, definitely not polio for sure. Um, and he noticed that my dad walked with a, uh, a waddling gait. And as he watched us walk, you know, we walked in the same way. And so based on that and um, elevation of creatine kinase, he confirmed it was a form of MD. But this was in about 1979, and not as much was known about muscle diseases. And um, he just didn't want to put a label on it. He said it, it didn't match anything he'd seen, and he didn't really know how to identify it. So we basically, I progressed through my childhood knowing I had MD, but not really knowing which type of MD it was. Um, when I was little, I'm, I think I even noticed there was something wrong with me before my parents did. And, but I was so very young, somewhere, you know, three to four years of age. So I actually made up a, an imaginary friend, and my imaginary friend rode in a wheelchair, and he had two broken legs. And I would talk about him all the time. His name was Murphy. And it was very curious. Adults would, you know, especially wonder why did Murphy have two broken legs? And the cast went clear up to his hip. And I think it was my way of trying to explain that I had something wrong with my legs and my muscles. And I didn't really have any other way to explain it at such a young age. Um, and the other thing that I would talk about when I trip on the sidewalk, there'd be sticks. And even just the feeling of sticks brushing against my legs could make me topple over. And so to my mom, I would explain that they were witch's fingers, because that's what they looked like to me as a little kid. Um, but despite this, um, I got along pretty well in school. I was a very active child with friends, wanting to make friends, wanting to play on the playground. And um, I enjoyed things such as uh, learning to ride a bike, roller skating, and jump rope. But um, trying to walk um, with a group of people, I would always have a tendency to fall behind and stumble and fall. And so it was frustrating. Basically, I could play with peers in a small setting, but trying to um, do things in a large gym or go on a long walk were, were always difficult for me. Um, also, the other problem that I was having was a um, shortened Achilles tendon. And the best way I can describe it is with someone with Emory Dreyfus, the Achilles tendon isn't flexible and pliable. It's more the consistency of a wine cork. You know, so the frustration for both the patient and the therapist trying to stretch that particular tendon, it just won't any easier than a wine cork in your hand. So um, around the age of seven, I had to have my heel cords lengthened. And I wore walking casts until they were ready to come off. And it was just an incredible transformation in my life. Um, I think I would have lost the ability to walk at age seven. But through having that uh, wonderful surgery, I was able to walk till 30, age 33. Um, so that made an incredible difference in my childhood. Um, and the one thing my parents noted, it didn't seem like the muscle weakness um, was progressing at a steady rate. As I uh, progressed through childhood, we, we kind of had a sense of saying, oh, no, not, a, not another growth spurt, because it appeared that as I had a growth spurt, the muscle weakness would become more severe. It seemed like growing was difficult. And not only the process of growing, I noticed I was different than my peers, and they noticed I was different because I, as I approached adolescence, um, kids would notice they could wrap their finger around my elbow or my ankle because the circumference of my limbs was so small. And I really hated being different. I hated kids pointing this out and, and noticing that. And I began to be really uncomfortable even with the approach, approaching of puberty because it seemed like things were 
snowballing. They were getting much, much worse as my body was signaled to grow and develop. Um, and it, it turned out to be um, true in my life. Um, the most progressive muscle weakness was occurring right at the age of puberty. And at the age of 15, I also developed scoliosis and had to have surgery for that. Um, following this, life became a little bit easier. Um, I learned to drive a car and spend time with friends. And I liked that so much better than trying to walk and keep up with people. And um, I was really excited kind of to strike out on my own as I entered my late teens because I needed to know, well, what did I have? What was the name of it? What was my prognosis? I really kind of was entering this important phase of life, not knowing much at all about my future. So I spent some time working in a laboratory. I spent a lot of time as a college student and I was state studying genetics. And I would just spend a great deal of time in the library because I thought, well, I'll just read everything I can find and see if something matches. And um, the incredible thing was the very first time I saw a picture of Emory Dreyfus was in the summer of 1994. And I went down to a library in the hospital and within about two minutes, I had gone from knowing nothing about my condition to probably looking at the first picture I'd ever seen of someone like me. And I literally spent the first two minutes just kind of strumming my finger against the different medical journals. And I stopped at this one called Muscle and Nerve and pulled out a journal. And it dropped on the floor, floor unexpectedly. And as I sat on the floor to turn over the page where it had fallen, I was met with an article about Emory Dreyfus. And um, there was two photographs of two brothers, and they were the most incredible vari variable penetrance I think I've ever seen in two patients. Um, and one was affected much more severely than the other brother. And when I read the article, I noticed that I had all these symptoms that they were describing, things like my neck not being able to bend forward, my elbows that were fixed in flexion, and my heels that couldn't touch the floor. And the analogy I like to give is that it's very similar to if you've ever held a Barbie doll. Those are some of the characteristics of the Barbie doll that you notice as you, as you hold the doll and touch it. Um, so people wonder, well, how did you just know? And it was based on photographs that I could see. I just recognized the muscle weakness and the look of the body, but then also these symptoms being so similar to a Barbie doll. And the curiosity was that the article only was describing sex-linked recessive patients, whereas our case was on a somal dominant. So I thought, well, this couldn't be us. And the other concern was, they, I believe they were describing cardiac problems. And I thought, well, that couldn't be us either because I don't know anything about this. So back in that summer of 94, I, you know, the name was triggered of Emory Dreyfus, but I hadn't officially really decided that's what we had. Um, so when I went to Iowa State, I spent even more time looking and reading, but it always came back to Emory Dreyfus. And then as I um, looked further, I noticed that there were some cases of, of female cases with Emory Dreyfus, but they were pretty sporadic in the literature. So I brought the articles home with me, and I didn't want anyone really to see them, so I remember putting them under a, a large stack of books and kind of hiding them um, for my dad when I went to go make some microwave popcorn in the kitchen. And in just the two or three minutes that I was gone, for some reason he can't even explain, he, he just wanted to know what I was learning in college and found this article and started reading it. And when I came back in the room minutes later, I, I tried to take it from my, you know, I said, oh, you don't want to read that. And he said, no, no, I really need to because I have all these cardiac problems. And I wasn't aware that he had many of the things that were listed in the article. So um, I went to my neurologist and I said, um, you know, that I thought that this is what we had, but she, she was definitely sure, no, it, it wasn't this, and um, didn't want to go contact the cardiologist. And so I went ahead and did that, and he had brought my father in and um, did confirm that he did have cardiac involvement. Um, so the next step was I thought, well, I'd love to know, can we confirm this? Is there a gene? And I found there was a team of Italian scientists that had found the Emerin gene responsible for the sex-linked recessive cases. And I wrote to them and I described my family and I said, would you, would you possibly want to look at us for this study? And they were just thrilled because 
there are so few people in the world to draw from for this study. And they asked me to send uh, blood. And um, unfortunately, I went back to my uh, the same doctor, and she did not want to be a part of this, did not believe we were on the right track. So I actually had a nurse that uh, was a friend of mine, and she, um, she took the uh, blood samples that just drawn from our home around the kitchen table. And um, so we sent that off to Italy. And you know, in today's time, sequencing is really exciting. It moves really quickly. But in this time, it took several years to get the information back to us. And um, she had also drawn blood from my uh, father's half-brother and just as a control. And this is an extremely healthy muscular man who had a career in the National Guard, kind of one of those people you'd say, can you help me move this piece of furniture? And when they were getting the results in, they were very uh, shocked to tell us that my dad's half-brother, who was a very strong person, also appeared to have a mutation in the gene um, called lamin A. And at the time, we, we really didn't even know what to make of this. I remember inviting my uncle over and we told him, and in the nervousness of the situation, we all began to laugh, and we just said, well, somebody messed up those test tubes. And we had no idea that that could have anything relevant to go on with the story. It was just a, you know, a curious thing, and we just chalked it up to, a, to an accident. Um, then at following this, I guess life moved forward in a great way. Um, you know, I, I knew now what I had and was able to talk about it, and it, I ended up meeting my husband, Jeremy, and it was a very, very difficult decision, but we, we did have a child who was naturally conceived. I have one son, and he fortunately does not have the laminate mutation. Um, we had him tested when he was four months of age, and it was, it was an incredible relief to find out he does not have it. Um, let's see, moving forward. Um, when I was um, 25 years old, I worked as an intern at Johns Hopkins Medical School. And as part of the internship, I was helping um, Dr. Katherine Wilson, and she was mapping the different diseases that were attributed to lamin A on um, a map of the gene. And traditionally, I'd been taught that there was one disease per one gene, at least that's what was thought in the 90s. And lamin was turning out to be a very um, interesting gene. And at this point, I believe we're approaching 20 different diseases that are attributed to this very tiny gene. And I read about a disease called Dunnigan type familial partial lipodystrophy. And as I, again, as I looked at the pictures and I was reading the symptoms, I realized that many of these patients were missing body fat in the same places that I was. And particularly, they had very, uh, a significant loss of fat on both their arms and legs. And nothing really came of this at this point, but it was just another fact that I kind of um, put into my mind for future use. And years later, when my youngest sister, um, she had extremely minimal muscle weakness, also have a, has a mutation in lamin A, she was concerned about the missing fat on her body and um, I told her about this other condition that perhaps she had some symptoms related to this. And she went to a convention in California and met with other women with this and came back really interested to tell us that there was this Olympic athlete that was suspected of having this fat loss genetic disorder. And, you know, I, it wasn't until I really looked at pictures of this athlete, not her running pictures, but just casual photos at home that I realized, wow, I see a spark of recognition in these photographs of this athlete, particularly in her upper arm. There were things, details about both her fat and muscle distribution that looked um, strikingly like my sister. And my sister was really, um, you know, basically like a size two, a small person, but her bicep muscles were very prominent to the point that at the mall or in public places, people would come up and say, wow, what do you do to get these incredible muscles in your upper arm? Um, and in contrast, my biceps were basically like three spaghetti noodles strung together. I just did not have a lot of mass whatsoever in my, my muscles. But when I began to see the connection, I knew from my work at Johns Hopkins, I think this athlete really does have a mutation in the laminate gene and made the leap that, well, if she does, this is 
one of the most incredible things we've probably ever found in muscle biology because we're seeing a disease that could toggle both directions. Could it lead to enhanced muscle development and then a graphic loss of muscle even within a, uh, immediate family members? There was just something really intriguing about this story. So um, just by chance, I happened to catch David Epstein, a, a journalist, and he was on Good Morning America, and he was talking about his book, The Sports Gene. And he was looking into um, athletics and um, gen genetics, and particularly um, Olympic athletes, and trying to investigate, you know, what made someone truly excel at athletics. Was it genetic? Was it hard work, perseverance? Was it everything? And um, so I wrote to him, and I really didn't expect that he would write back, but he did the next day. And um, he wasn't ready to leap into this at first. It seemed like a very curious story, but um, we talked for probably a year and a half, bouncing off ideas. And I shared with him a lot of the photographs I saw. Um, one of the symptoms I'd noticed from, from my teenage years was that my veins were very prominent in my arms and legs. And it, initially, my neurologist and other doctors just said, well, you don't have enough muscle to cover them. And as an adolescent, it just didn't seem like a logical explanation to me at all. And for the first time, I was seeing someone with the same symptom and an incredible musculature, but with overlapping symptoms. So as David and I uh, talked about this, he decided eventually to call Priscilla's agent, describe this situation and Priscilla was excited when they called and was describing different things she'd encountered since childhood and was really curious about this as well. And originally I just assumed I would call her and she would say, oh sure, I had this tested, here's my mutation, this is what we found out. And I was really surprised to learn that even though she had wanted to know for many years, no one knew what test to order, what, what gene to look at. Um, and she was extremely interested to have this testing done to see if there was a connection between our cases. Um, I was certainly hoping we had exactly the same point mutation because I thought that would just be incredible. But as it turns out, we were extremely close, but just a little bit off in our mutations. And um, when we did this, and I, I like to compare it, you know, it was like we ended up in neighboring lanes. True, I wasn't running track with her, but it was just kind of a, a cool analogy to think of it that way. Um, but I was just very fortunate that I met an incredibly warm and personable um, person who was just very kind and considerate, didn't need to do what she did, um, but wanted to help another family. So she's uh, been a terrific person to know um, as a friend as well. And um, one of the most shocking things is that even though I had wanted my point mutation to be exactly what Priscilla's was, what I had been searching for actually was true and is attributed to the ProPublica article that was shared with uh, David Epstein wrote. We did make a note that there is a, a case, at least one reported in the literature, where there was a patient with significant neuromuscular disease sharing the same point mutation as Priscilla. And it's one of the most mind-boggling um, things I've ever heard of in science that this could, could possibly occur, but um, it just leaves someone with so much awe and so many questions about how such divergent cases could come about. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to turn things back over to Julia, if I could. Yeah, thank you so much, Jill, for telling us your story and also your research. Um, as a quick reminder, if you have a question, please do type it into the Q&A box. And our next speaker is Helen Savage. Please go ahead. Thank you, Julia. So after um, reading Joe's story and the ProPublica article, I and, and we at Congenica, as I'm sure all of the um, other attendees as well, are, uh, were incredibly touched by Joe's story and inspired as well. Um, I mean, the article by David Epstein in ProPublica covers Jill and her family's life to date, including her journey to diagnosis. And the headline described Jill as a DIY scientist, but really, as we've heard, she's so much more than that. 
She's incredibly inspiring. She's highly motivated, and she's really taken charge of her own diagnosis, not only to help her and her family's lives, but also other people's lives for the best of us. So we at Congenica are really passionate about rare disease and improving the lives of patients through better diagnosis. As a spin out from the Sanger Institute um, in Cambridge in the UK, uh, we're built on the foundations of the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project. And in-house, we have years and years of clinical and technical expertise working in the rare disease field. And we've rolled all of this expertise and incorporated it into our clinical decision support tool uh, called Sapientia. So uh, we, like, like Jill, <laughs> um, suspected that there may be some additional underlying genetic cause to explain the vastly different phenotypes and presentations, not only in the members of Jill's family with Emory Dreyfus, but also in the wider patient population of individuals who have these laminar mutations. As Sapientia is embedded in multiple clinical institutes worldwide, some of whom are named here, um, we had the confidence that if there was something there to be found, then we would be able to find it using Sapientia. So we decided to try and get in touch to see if there was anything that we and Sapientia could offer Jo and her family. So initial contact was made by our Vice President of Business Development, uh, Craig Taylor. Craig's really been instrumental in helping us get um, the project set up and really see it through to its current point. Once initial contact had been made, we were really delighted to find that Jill was willing to join us in investigating the differences in her family's muscle phenotypes. And not only that, she was also happy to engage her family as well. Really, the primary aims of our investigation were to determine if there might be a second disorder segregating in the family, or alternatively, if there was a possible genetic modifier of the laminar mutation in Jill and her family. So we didn't do this by ourselves. We consulted with our chief medical officer, um, Professor Phil Beals, who's a professor of clinical genetics at the Institute of Child Health. Um, based in uh, University College down in London. And we arranged to pay for whole genome sequencing of Jill and three of her family members who also had the same laminar mutation. The whole study was performed under Professor Beale's guidance, really just to ensure that appropriate consent and accurate clinical and family information were being used by the clinical scientist team who were performing the analysis on um, the genome sequences from Jill's family. Of course, the investigation wasn't without its challenges. Um, as family members naturally share a large proportion of genetic variants, um, finding a good candidate was always going to be a little bit little, was always going to be a little bit tricky. Um, knowing where to, to focus the search in terms of where to look in in the whole genome, and also the fact that the variant may be a common variant and only cause this. Uh, unusual phenotype when paired with a laminar mutation. And this meant that perhaps some routine filtering protocols that we would normally use wouldn't be feasible. So I'll pass over to Susie now, who will um, talk you through what we did. So we sent um, Jill and three of her sibling samples um, away for whole genome sequencing. Um, and then the data were processed using the EDICO genome pipeline. And then the resultant variants loaded into Sapientia for analysis and for variant review by the clinical team. So of course, whole genome sequencing gives us an awful lot of data. It gives us um, information on all the genes in the genome. Um, and so, while Jill and her family already had the Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy diagnosis with the known laminar mutation, we started our analysis by reconfirming this mutation in the whole genome data. And to do this, um, we used our Sapientia tool to um, apply a series of filters to help focus our analysis. 
To do that, we applied um, what we call a gene panel, and um, we used this to filter out the, or rather filter in, if you like, the, the genes um, which are associated with um, disease. So in this instance, we were looking at those um, associated with muscular phenotypes. We apply filter settings um, to um, filter out um, very common variants in this instance, um, to look at those which are absent or extremely low frequency in healthy individuals. And then we also use a series of other filters looking at protein consequence and so on. There are a number of other um, features within Sapientia that we use for a variant review. Um, and this includes um, using integrated tools such as looking at the minor allele frequency in the population. We use their integrated genome browser um, to look at um, curated variant tracks such as ClinVar. And then we also use the tool um, Examizer, which helps us to prioritize variants for review. In addition, we look at the literature that has been published, both on um, the gene and if possible the variant level. And within Sapientia, this literature can be bookmarked um, for your future reference. And also we include features such as PubMed search and also um, Google search, which pre-populates with a search string. We collate all this information and use it to um, apply the ACMG guidelines, which we uh, annotate in Sapientia. And so we document all of these pieces of evidence within the software. And so um, we obviously reconfirm the laminate mutation. And here you can see the, the genome browser. And the top panel shows you the gene and the transcript. The second panel here shows you the protein. And then here we can see the laminate mutation um, in Jill and her three siblings who were sequenced. And so this pedigree just shows you um, which of those individuals were sequenced, and you can also see the phenotype information for each of those individuals. So we then went on to the main point of the study, which was to see whether there was a second genetic disorder which segregates in the family and which may account for the phenotypic um, variability. We were looking for variants which were present in Jill um, and her brother without the hypermusculature versus her brother and sister with the hypermusculature and vice versa. And so we started to look at um, genes which were associated with neuromuscular conditions, including EDMD, like dystrophy, myopathy, and other neuromuscular phenotypes. And we didn't identify in this um, stage um, any variants which would suggest that there was a second disorder that was shared between the two pairs of siblings. So while the um, clinical team were very hard at work um, back in Cambridge, I was lucky enough to attend the American Society of Human Genetics meeting over in Vancouver in 2016. And amongst the huge number of groundbreaking and really interesting talks on a wide range of topics, was a single slide in a presentation by uh, Jay Zeberatow. And this is actually on a skeletal disease called um, spondylocarpotarsal syndrome or SCT syndrome. And uh, this single slide showed a picture of a, a Belgian blue. This is a, a breed of super cow famed for its hypermusculature. And in a far less polite association, perhaps, than was made by Jill between her, her family and, and an Olympic athlete, I wondered if this double muscling effect um, that was present in the Belgian blue could have a similar underlying cause in humans. So the muscular appearance of these cows is actually caused by a mutation in the myostatin gene. And um, myostatin is a member of the TGF-beta signaling pathway involved in skeletal muscle growth 
and development. I was unsure if we'd included the TGF beta pathway genes in our analysis. I was fairly sure that we'd included myostatin, but I wasn't really sure about the rest. So on the off chance that we might have missed something during our analysis, or on the off chance the team back in Cambridge needed some uh, additional places to focus their analysis, I contacted the clinical team uh, from my chair in the uh, auditorium <laughs> at the conference to suggest that we could include these additional genes in our analysis. So on receiving Helen's email um, suggesting the TGS beta pathway, um, we set to refining our analysis. The TGS beta pathway is, is very complex and it involves many different components. Um, so we again applied a slightly different gene panel this time, focusing on the genes in this pathway to filter variants, and again looking for the commonality um, between um, the two groups of siblings. And this analysis just resulted in, in one variant, um, and this variant was common to Jill and her brother with a similar phenotype, but it was absent from her two siblings with the excess um, muscle growth. It was also absent um, from NOMAD, so the um, large um, population um, data set which we used to do some uh, analysis. Um, and it's just variant in SMAD7, this missing variant in SMAD7. Um, and here in the pedigree, you can see which of the siblings um, were wild type and which of those were heterozygous for this variant. We can also see that um, this um, amino acid that was changed was um, pretty well conserved down to zebrafish. And then um, we looked in the um, exact um, database hosted by the Broad Institute and looked at the missense constraint score, which is um, 3.87, and that suggested that the missense variants are not particularly well tolerated in this gene. So what does TGF, um, sorry, what does SMAD7 um, do? Well, it inhibits TGF beta and myostatin signaling by competing with RSMADs for binding with type 1 receptor, and it might play a role in modulating muscle mass. In 2006, Coley et al. Um, suggested that SMAD7 promotes and enhances skeletal muscle differentiation and that it's required for the formation of muscular tissue and that knocking down SMAD7 blocks muscle specific gene expression and differentiation of cultured muscle cells. More recently, in 2015, there was a publication showing that the genetic reduction of SMAD7 in mice results in decreased muscle growth, decreased strength, delayed regeneration, and alteration in fiber type composition. And in 2016, SMAD7 was implicated in prenatal skeletal muscle development in pigs. And just in 2016, um, muscle directed SMAD7 gene delivery in mice. Um, was described as an approach for preventing muscle wasting under conditions um, where excessive ACTAR2B signaling occurs. So having this um, body of evidence, we discussed the results with um, Phil Bill, their Chief Medical Officer, and we all agreed that the result was pertinent enough to feed back um, to Jill. So we had a teleconference and discussed these results with her, and I'll now pass back to Jill to finish the story. New up. Oh, hello. Um, it was really terrific to receive the information of this um, potential modifier gene. Um, it really um, answered a lot of questions. I think what I maybe forgot to mention was that there was extraordinary variability even among siblings. Um, there were two, myself and my brother, that had far more progressive muscle weakness than another brother and sister who all, all four of us inherited the laminate mutation, but with strikingly different um, effects on our musculature, and also in comparison to my father. Um, my dad was able to walk until the age of 57, and for me, I was not able to walk past the age of 32. And this was also true for another um, brother of mine as well. Um, so finding this out was just really very much a, a missing link 
in trying to gain understanding of our diagnosis. Um, and I found it uh, personally curious. I remember as even a kindergartner trying to grapple with the situation, I was fascinated with the book Charlotte's Web and Wilbur the Pig in particular. And it was just really touching when they shared the results and they have the article about um, birth weight of, of newborn pigs. I just found that to be um, pretty interesting as well. Um, using this information, I think what's so exciting is we're going from taking years to find a, a gene for a disorder than to find a modifier. And with the information that I gained from Congenica, um, it was suggested to me by a prominent researcher in the field that I may be a terrific candidate um, for a myostatin inhibitor, a new uh, classification of drugs that are not yet clinically available but are being investigated. And I did approach a large pharmaceutical company to inquire if I could uh, use this type of medication uh, through a compassionate use program. And unfortunately, that was declined, but I, I did make the attempt, and it did mean so much that I had the chance to even uh, pursue that angle of investigation. Um, what we plan to do from here, um, working with Dr. Lori Walrath at University of Iowa, um, we are trying to find out if this is a unique situation just in my family, or perhaps is this modifier gene, are there mutations present in other people with hemorrhagitis, um, muscular dystrophy, particularly um, my suspicion is at the more severe end of the spectrum. Um, fortunately, we do have a Facebook group of people with hemorrhagitis, and I believe at this point we have approximately uh, 360 people from around the world. And so I um, have presented the idea to them, and just getting a rough count, we've already have probably about 60 people that have come forward and they would love to um, participate in a study with the University of Iowa to look at their SPAN7 gene as well. Um, and I'd also, I'm gonna go ahead and share a picture taken last summer when I visited the lab. Um, and I'm um, just truly thankful for um, the grants that are allowing the University of Iowa to go forward with this project and the people that are excited to learn more about how SPAN7 may impact the severity of hemorrhagitis muscular dystrophy.